Hi, welcome to the 12th House Podcast. I'm Michelle Palazon, your host in the Head Witch in Charge here at Holisticism. And I'm so happy that you're tuning in for our third episode of our death series here on the 12th House Podcast. We're double clicking on death, dying, and how to relate to it as spiritual people and how death shows up. You know, death is like the ultimate archetypal experience. And it's something that we're afraid to talk about and afraid to confront with good reason, you know, <laughs> with good reason that it's like the ultimate mystery and arguably the thing, the underlying thing that motivates our every move, <laughs> most of our moves. And we don't give it a lot of thought, at least out loud. And so this series of episodes, this deep dive into death and dying, you know, we're trying to not make it light necessarily, but look at death, the death experience, the dying experience, what it means and relate to it in a different way. Just open up a different kind of conversation and dialogue. And I'm so delighted that you guys are enjoying it. If you haven't already listened to our last two episodes, uh, last two Tuesday episodes, go check them out. They're awesome. But I'm, I'm so excited for this episode and this guest. So excited. I had the pleasure of talking with Patricia Pearson, who's an author and journalist and just all around wonderful person, fascinating person. We had a great conversation and we wanted to talk to Patricia because she wrote this book called Opening Heaven's Door, What the Dying May Be Trying to Tell Us About Where They're Going. And in her book, Patricia talks about and explores things like near-death experiences and what happens at the end of our lives for dying people, what they see, what they what they go through, these phenomenons that can't be explained by science. How when someone's dying, they'll they'll see their grandmother in the corner of the room, or how even when people are passing through the threshold from life to death, we see an echo of them, an energetic or spiritual echo of them as the living, you know, there are so many stories of people who have, who have seen their grandfather woken up in the middle of a dream, seen their grandfather standing at the foot of their bed and saying, I love you and I'll see you soon. And then they get a phone call the next morning that, you know, a few hours later, their, their grandfather had passed. It's not rare, this phenomenon. And we don't talk about it very much. So Patricia is incredible. And I'm so excited for you to hear this conversation. And, you know, I was trying to think about really what it was that really, that, that struck me so much about Patricia and, and her research and this, in, the, in particular, this experience of death, right? And like why we wanted to talk about it. And it got me to thinking about, and what we talk about in this episode is how science and sort of like fact, quote unquote, fact-based or evidence-based relationships and understanding of death, how, how much that community sort of shames or invalidates experiences of that are unexplainable. And even having this conversation, you know, sort of jumped me back in my timeline to my early 20s when I had a couple people die around me in really horrible ways, surprising ways, who were very young. And I didn't really know how to relate to it. And I didn't really have, you know, I didn't really have anyone who like helped me through it. You know, everyone was going through their own process. And I remember going to like Barnes and Noble in Union Square in New York and sort of embarrassingly walking through the aisles of the spiritual section and and ending up in front of like mediumship and past lives and reincarnation and angels and near-death experiences and sort of loading my arms with these books that had these wacky covers and, you know, that had like word art, you know, in front of them and that were in some way consciously, I was like, I know these are embarrassing. Like these are embarrassing books to read. These are spiritual. These are, this is like quackery, right? But 
those books, those reading those stories, stories of other people going through the same things that I was going through and actually having these open-ended answers or potential explanations for what happens when we die were the things that brought me the most peace and helped me so much more than the sort of scientific, I don't know, like robotic explanation of death and what happens to us. And I think that that's, I don't, I'm not stupid enough to think that that's a unique experience to me, you know, that, that I'm the only person who's sort of creeping through the, the section of Barnes and Noble that if, if your friend from high school found you or if your, your uncle found you there, they'd be like, what are you doing? And you'd be a little embarrassed. But I think that there's something there. There's something about that thread. And I, Patricia, Patricia and I talk about it in this episode, how really we've been sort of shamed to believe in these experiences that we have, to trust the truth of our experiences, of our spiritual experiences that can't be explained away with science easily and and the impact of that globally, you know, all the way down to the micro, down to the individual, how much that can can really contribute to either how we decide to cope and how we do cope with something like death and dying and how we choose to live or, or not. And I thought, you know, this conversation was endlessly interesting to me. Patricia is so smart. You got to check her out. You got to buy her book. She's brilliant. And I'm going to be thinking about this for a long time, but that really sparked something in me of remembering like, oh yeah, I remember, <laughs> I remember reading that book and, and feeling embarrassed about it and hiding the cover when I was reading it on the subway, but finding so much peace in it and how so much of spirituality and mysticism and magic feels like a great remembering as we talked about with Mary Lou last week. And also there's something about that remembering that's still, it's it's still shamed in us. And maybe as spiritual people, like our only real job is to remember and to, I don't know, like strengthen ourselves so that we can move past our own judgments and our own shame and be okay with how other people decide to perceive us. That has nothing to do with us. Be okay with maybe someone thinking that we're silly or stupid or pathetic, whatever you want to call it, desperate. Let's say that. That's a better word. Desperate. And and not trying to correct them, you know, just letting it be. And I think that if you're grappling with that potentially, maybe not around death and spirituality, but in some other way, right? Trying to justify who you are and what you believe to the world around you or to people who maybe don't get it. I think you'll really like this episode and you'll really love Patricia because she's a beautiful example of trusting yourself and trusting what you know, trusting what you believe and what you've experienced and leaving room for the unknown, which is honestly, I think, a sign of superior intelligence because only really smart people admit that they don't know everything. So with that, I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to let you get into the episode with with Patricia. I'm going to let you get into the episode with Patricia and I'll see you on the other side. And sure. Patricia, it's so nice to talk to you. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. I, I Wallace and I were just geeking out over everything that you've done. And honestly, you're kind of an icon and we've been, we've been talking about you a lot because you seem like someone who has a lot of seemingly disparate interests, lots of different types of things that fascinate you and and that doesn't make you flaky or weird it makes you interested in the world around you how did like how do you sort of bring together all the concepts and things that you're intrigued and inspired by how do you think about them or how do you justify them for yourself well it's a good question because like I'm a branding nightmare because <laughs> okay. I, I can't stay on one subject and I think it's because what happens like it, the, you know I need to go really deep into a subject. If I want to mm. write a book, if I want to put two, three, four Ow. years of my life into exploring a subject, it has to be really meaningful and it has to be something that I don't personally understand. Mm. So that process becomes one of figuring out, well, 
you know, why do I have generalized anxiety disorder? What does that even mean? You know, what would it have meant like to my great grandmother? So I'll just go down rabbit holes. And then that's my cat meowing for you. (laughs) Hey, Chubby. (laughs) (laughs) And then then hopefully I, you know, I can kind of go down, rummage around, figure stuff out and bring it back out and make it of service to other people so that it resonates with them. And they're like, oh, yeah, you know what happened to you? You're so honest about it. Now I can talk about it happening to me. And the way you make sense of it kind of helps me to make sense of it in my own life. So that's probably a common theme of what my books are, is trying to get to what's real for women and, you know, to the places that, you know, where we're very vulnerable and need to be really candid and, you know, and get there and really challenge some of the received wisdoms that we get and say, no, what's really going on for us? Hmm. That's, I love that personally. I'm also a branding nightmare. You know, I love so many different things that in some ways seem totally contradictory to each other or even antagonistic and love them with like my whole chest, you know, and I'm, I'm deeply interested in all these sort of weird different ideas that don't maybe make sense to the outside Um, viewer, but in my brain are somehow connected. And I'm really curious, actually, I was just having a conversation with someone today who's a spiritual person. And she's like, you know, I'm really obsessed with true crime right now. I can't stop listening to true crime podcasts. I can't stop like reading true crime books. And I don't really know where it's coming from. And it seems like you're someone who's also, because you've written books about true crime. Do you have a theory about why women in particular, especially women who are spiritual, maybe would be would find true crime so resonant for some reason or so fascinating? Well, I think that like the first book that I did was about violent women and I was really Mm -hmm. interested in exploring that subject, but, but that got me thinking about, you know, the audience for that is for true crime is women, which I didn't realize until I wrote that book. Really? Yeah. And, and so then I thought, Oh, wow, that's really interesting. So why is it women who are so, so interested and can tolerate like what's scary about true crime. And then I went to a true crime, um, podcast convention actually in Nashville Mm -hmm. and and it was one weekend and I think like three years ago and it was it was prom weekend so there was this whole hotel complex and about 50 percent of it was young women in satin dresses and the other 50 percent of it was women in sweatshirts that said things like splatter matters (laughs) and there was no men there were no men it was all women Sounds like heaven, honestly. (laughs) It was so interesting. And I thought, well, why are all these women so interested in this? And I thought a couple of reasons. One is, I think, I think that women feel vulnerable and on some fundamental level, really mistrust men and also really want to mind read men. And most violent criminals are male. Mm -hmm. So So to be able to plumb the psyche of the violent criminal and kind of see where it might separate from the boyfriend who dumped you in a really sociopathic way, Mm -hmm. or or does it even separate? You know, is there something about the criminality of of the male mind that maps onto some of our personal experiences and hurts that makes us want to figure it out? And, And it's almost like they're... You know, it's almost like serial killers are kind of like the shadow side of like our biggest jerk boyfriends. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's yeah. something in there, I think, that interests women. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that, that idea of intuition, what you said, like intuiting or, or mind reading somebody and really like getting under their skin to understand them, especially yeah. I think as like really deeply, so many intuitive people are so empathic maybe even to a fault. And when you can't empathize with someone, you can't understand someone, that makes you want to understand them even more, right? It's like, what what kind of riddle are you? I so I could that's see, that's yeah, I could see that being the, the sort of wormhole. Yeah, it is like that. It's like a wormhole and it's a trap because, mm-hmm. because we have empathy when you go down that wormhole. Certainly this is what happened to me is that I wound up with post-traumatic stress disorder. So Really? I wound up covering a couple of really, really intense murder trials um, and and started and just started losing my ability to tell the difference between who was good and who was evil and just, you know, had like a complete breakdown. Wow. Around 1993, so oh, that's it's, fascinating. It's, yeah, yeah. It's 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 a double edged sword becoming that interested in something that evil. Yeah, I can 
I could see how that would be dysregulating and almost make you question everything, right? Uh, like what is true? What is real? Does anyone have real, like, can I trust anybody? <laughs> That's right. And, and you know, you the, the boundaries blurred so much. Like I remember one day I was walking, after I went to this murder trial, I was walking down a, a snowy country road and I was by myself and I heard the crunching footsteps behind me and I, I froze and I was like, oh my God, this is it. I'm now going to be the one who's murdered. And, you know, everything ran through my psyche about how to respond and self-defense mm -hmm. and everything. And I turned around and it was like a six-year-old girl skipping. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So, and then you're like, okay, I need help. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't. <laughs> Bye, true crime. <laughs> we need to take a break. Just rom-coms only for a little bit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's exactly what happened. I wrote a little bit of comedy. <laughs> that is such a, I think, kind of an interesting segue into your I think one of your next books or a book that came relatively that came after the book about yes. violence which yeah. was opening heaven's door which is about death and near-death experiences I'm actually like before we dive into near-death experiences did your ex exploration of death and the beyond help you recover from the PTSD of all that sort of like murder true crime not being able, feeling like you couldn't trust anyone. Did it, did it have any effect on you, positive or negative? No, it was a, there was a time gap because I did the true crime and then I wrote a couple of comic novels about parenting, about motherhood. <laughs> and one of them was adapted for television for Lifetime. And then, cool. and then being a mother and being in a different headspace and a much more lighthearted headspace for quite a long time went on. And then when my daughter was 11 and my son was eight, my sister and father died within nine weeks of each other. And mm -hmm. what, so what really catapulted me down the path to opening heaven's door was that my sister had breast cancer and she was sitting up in her bedroom in Montreal, Canada. And it was like three in the morning and she'd been, you know, so, so anxious and so obviously, you know, existentially freaked out by what was going on with her. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, one night, she woke up and she felt hands on the back of her head, really gently cupping her. And there was this presence in her bedroom. And it filled her with this sense of contentment and peace and that things were going to be okay. And then and she wrote an email to her boyfriend in Vermont about it. And then after that, she got the phone call and my father had suddenly died in the middle of that night. Oh, my gosh. And so all of us were like, whoa, 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 whoa. What was that? What what just happened? What happened? what happened? Well, first of all, how did dad just die? Like that, you know, he wasn't even sick. Yeah. And then what, how did Catherine have that experience? Like she wasn't even a, a spiritual seeker of any kind. Like it wasn't even on her radar to feel that way. So it was so galvanizing to all of us. And that's what sent me down that road of, of looking at death from a completely, from going completely the opposite direction from, from evil and dark to light and, and, consoling did you find the process of writing that book was it healing for or was it part of the grief process for you as you went through that experience that two big deaths in your family to people who are so close to you yeah eventually like the first year after dad and Catherine died we were all so shocked that I think for a whole year I couldn't even write in my diary like I couldn't I didn't dare to make sense of the world mm -hmm. in a way Mm -hmm. for at least a year and then I began to think about writing this book and going through the process of writing that book and all of the things I learned about about the dying process really really came brought me around to, to a, a, a very healed space I think a really yeah m much better space and also my mother so my mother was kind of cheering me on and she was watching over my shoulder and she's like what did you learn this week and I think for both of us it, it, it wound up becoming a really really good way to recover from those deaths. Mm -hmm. You seem like the type of person and you've said who goes down into like you, you take something and you go all the way as deep as you possibly can was there a trigger though obviously beyond the deaths of your sister and your father a story or someone who you met who you're like I need to go further with this or something that really that you can like put your finger on is like yep this is how I knew I was going to write a whole and publish a whole book on this on this concept of life after death or yeah, the, the knowing that death of what's beyond 
yes, I think the trigger was I was at a bar and it was just before Christmas and it was about a year after my sister died and I ran into an old university friend, this guy, he wasn't a close friend, and but he asked me what I'd been up to and I mentioned the sense presence that my sister had had the night my father had died and how much that had meant to her. Mm-hmm. And he leaned over to me and he said, I don't mean to be unkind, but your sister was clearly imagining things. <gasps> Whoa. And that was the trigger to say, you know what? Up here. <laughs> what do you know? You know nothing. Are you a neuroscientist? Mm-hmm. No, you're like a banker. So <laughs> I'm going to find out everything that other people who've actually experienced these things know. And like defend my sister's honor. Yeah. She said that happened to her. That happened to her. Wow. I love that. You, it was like, I'll show you. (laughs) You think you know so much, but I'll show you. (laughs) Yeah. I'm, I'm curious if you had like a thesis going into your research or if you kind of just like, where did you even start? Because with, with death, process and end of life and the beyond, there are so many threads, right? There are so many different directions that you can go in. We can talk about something like a near-death experience. We can talk about the sort of like echo of someone's soul as they're passing or as they're making that like threshold transition. And those of us who are, are left behind being able to contact them. We can even like, you know, double click on mediumship and how we can connect to our loved ones who have passed on years and years in the future. So how, did you have an inkling of like what exactly, what direction you were going to go in? Yeah, I wanted to follow the beats of the experience that my sister had that I didn't understand because we were really mm-hmm. close. Mm-hmm. And and she lost the capacity to speak the way, you know, dying people do. Right. And so she went past a place where I could no longer understand what was happening to her. And I wanted to understand it and she couldn't explain it to me. And so one of them was, was the presence that of my father, because she got sick, you know, she went downhill very fast after that. So we never had a chance to talk about that, yeah. about what that meant, which, how she interpreted it. And then there was the experience of her being in hospice, having been like this very anxious person, becoming very, very at ease and gracious and actually almost like super happy. Mm-hmm. And then there was the experience of her talking to somebody we couldn't see on the ceiling of her bedroom in the Mm -hmm. hospice, which made me explore deathbed visions. And so, oh, and then there was this, 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 this one day when she was in the hospice where she had what I later learned was called terminal lucidity, where she suddenly went from being like this person who could barely speak and barely lift her head off the pillow to being energized and eloquent and speaking in both Spanish and English and wow. um, entertaining everyone and saying, everybody come into my room and I want to talk to all of you. And it, it was so startling because she was so deeply, deeply ill at that point. Mm-hmm. But then I later realized that that's something that's quite common. And nurses actually take that as a sign that someone is about to die. Mm-hmm. So they have this this rousing of energy and clarity, which is really extraordinary to see. And it's such a gift to the people around them. I was going to say it is such a gift. I'm so glad you got to experience that. I'm going through death doula training and there are, you know, part of what we do is work in hospice and so many hospice workers, they know the beats of death and these experiences and it's, it's, they know they, it's almost like they can count down when someone has a, a lucid experience like that. They're like, okay, there's about this many, this many hours or this many days left. This is what this means. It's so interesting that it's not just a singular phenomenon, that it, it really is something that happens really consistently, really often at the end of life. And I think that these phenomenons, because we don't talk about death, they don't, they're just, they're sort of like brushed over. And it isn't until we experience death really close to us that we meet them and then we're not really allowed to talk about them all the time you know so we're like kind of left in this endless loop of trying to figure out what it all means and if it's a singular experience that is weird that we're not supposed to talk about or if it's if it's really special and we should hold it close to our you know close to the chest or if it's something that happens all the time and i think that's one of the biggest problems with death and dying in like globally but specifically, I can speak to the United States, 
we 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 like have divorced it from the spiritual experience and from a communal experience. It's so private now and commoditized. And oh, yeah, I know. We and lose so much knowledge. When you're in hospice, like as you as you know, they'll hand out a pamphlet and it'll say, Here's the things to expect your loved one to do and they're all physical, right? They're gonna mm-hmm. stop eating. Don't try to force them to eat. They're gonna sleep more, right? All those things. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, where is the pamphlet that says, here are the things that your loved one may do on a conscious level. They're going to start talking about wanting to go home. Don't worry. They don't mean they want you to take them out of the hospice. They mean they're going home in a spirit yes. sense, right? Yes. Like, That's happens? really important, actually. Right? Mm-hmm. Because families get really upset. And they're like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. I feel so badly that I've put her here and she wants to go home. And it's like, no, she's telling you she's ready to die. Mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. and you know terminal lucidity like you can expect that your loved one is doing this and it doesn't mean that they're rebounding and they're going to get better which mm-hmm. is a lot of what a lot of families think oh my god they're recovering mm-hmm. right? no mm-hmm. they're, they're, their soul is t- well in my theory anyway is that their soul is beginning to the how do you want to put this that their consciousness is beginning to disengage from their physical body so the consciousness mm-hmm. is beginning to be able to transcend the disease process mm-hmm. as it mm-hmm. starts to kind of separate. And I think that's what terminal lucidity is personally. Yeah. I think it's, you have studied it far longer than I have, but I, I agree. I think it's our soul kind of knowing, all right, time's up. <laughs> you're rerunning the, like your quota of words and things that you're allowed to do and say is you're getting to the near the end of it. So you better make sure you say the important things because time to go it's time to like disengage from this space for you as you were doing this research how did you who did you go to was it more anecdotal or did you talk to like where did you begin and and who did you really find the most helpful like I guess is it more stories from people who've had these experiences or or death workers or you know neuroscientists it was a combination the first thing was that I, the place I started was I was so surprised at the number of people who mm-hmm. were having these experiences or seeing it in their family members and coming to me and confiding it as opposed to announcing it publicly, like it was shameful, like it was crazy. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that in itself was so surprising that I wound up just kind of talking to more and more people, just even in my own immediate kind of social world. Like, wait a minute, has, did you ever see this? Did this ever happen? And just just confirming that this is a really common, but somehow kind of hidden modern human experience. And you're talking about that experience of seeing or feeling a loved one who is transitioning from life to death yeah. in some way, right? Yeah, having having visions of them in the room at the, at the end of your bed when they die, hearing them call your voice, just becoming aware from a distance that they are that they are dying or just what they are seeing. So it's like, you know, so and so it was dying and she saw her deceased grandmother in the room, but I never thought to mention it to anybody else because I thought it was just this wacky thing about morphine. Mm-hmm. Right? So it's like when you start to compare notes. So that was really important to me. And then the other thing was to try to figure out all the ways that we think that science has has explained this and then realize that they actually haven't. Really? Smoke and mirrors. Yeah, that was really interesting. It's like, okay, neuroscientists. So how do people hallucinate visually? And they're like, well, it turns out we don't really know. (laughs) You know what? I know neuroscientists kind of don't know a lot about a lot of things like don't get me wrong they're really smart but they also there's a lot that we don't know there's a lot that we don't know so a lot of the stuff that we are made to believe is happening with with in death and dying by like science headlines in the new york times or whatever is actually just them imposing their own theory Mm. it's it's their own superstition and their own belief which is that we are all just in fleshed robots and there's no way we have a soul and so we're just going to say well this is because of optical nerve 
student right or right oh yeah you're not seeing the light at the end of the tunnel it's your yeah. brain shutting down by doing a last ditch effort to you know electrically circuit your brain and that's what those flashes of light are right yeah and if you push at that you know and luckily i have background training as a journalist that i can push at that mm -hmm. then it's a house of cards which is fascinating it all falls apart they can't explain any of it do those those scientists or sort of like more quant you know minded people when you push them do you feel like they're afraid of death like that that's why they're trying to explain it away in such a sort of like i don't know hygienic you know like sort of unemotional way well i found that it it wound up breaking down into two different groups so you had you had some, this really interesting group of scientists and often actually they are emergency room physicians palliative care physicians cardiac mm -hmm. surgeons who actually do see this stuff yeah and and have become convinced that near death experiences are 100% real Mm -hmm. um, and there's more and more of them coming out and speaking publicly. And then you have this other group of scientists who are more like in the lab and away from real human beings. And I, I, I don't think it's that they're afraid of death. I think it's that they're afraid of, of, of spirituality. It gives them vertigo. Right. They're like, no, no, I can't. That's too, I can't, I wouldn't be able to explain it. So it's too scary. So it can't be true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like they don't like anything to be irrational. Right in their definition of irrational, you know? Yeah, and, and when you start to acknowledge all of the, all that you don't know, right, that you can't explain away, it really makes you question, well, what, how much do I really know? <laughs> do, am I com completely certain about these things that I, I believe to be true, that I found scientifically, quote unquote, to be exactly. true? Like it's, some, you know? it's destabilizing, right? It's, it freaks people out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I would argue that science is a meaning making system just like philosophy or spiritual any type of spirituality or you know something like astrology it's a way to understand the world that we decide is a way to understand the world and just make make sense and make meaning of it so we don't totally lose our shit because otherwise it is so scary you know yeah i agree that's exactly right it's I, it, it, science is a meaning making system and and it it's people need to remember that because then you fall into what's, you know, there's science as a unit of measurement or a process of measurement, and then there's scientism, right? Mm. Which is a prejudicial mm -hmm. belief in that only what science can explain can be true. Mm -hmm. And it's, I mean, we could, we could double click on that, I'm sure, in so many ways, but that's very patriarchal. And I would argue like pretty, pretty colonialist and, and white supremacist of that, that type of thinking, that belief that we can only believe science and anything else is not valid or it's not as worthy of understanding. Yeah, exactly. It's like, yeah. if the Navajo say that they're visited by the spirits of the dead, I was talking to this Navajo elder a couple of years ago in Topanga Canyon. She was so interesting. She was telling me about the spirit of her mother coming to visit her, or sorry, she was telling me about talking to the spirit of her deceased brother at her mother's dying bedside. And they were just yakking. So she's not she's not telling me this, like, confiding because she thinks she's crazy. She's like, right. this was so cool, right? <laughs> right? And to have a scientist come along and say, well, that can't be real because you Navajo are too dumb to discern between what's real and what, you know what I mean? Like, right. what the implicit prejudice of that is astounding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that, I mean, so much of spirituality is reduced down even people when people say woo woo right that's, that's yeah. such a pejorative term it's kind of it actually is pretty racist but not to say something's woo woo but it immediately sort of invalidates any spiritual experience that you're ha you have it's like well you know i'm a little i'm a little nuts i'm a little crazy i'm a little woo woo um when in reality, our spiritual experiences, or especially I would say end of life experiences, when we when we witness someone else die or we're we're in that grief process, those are the things that are the most true, are like the most directive on our path to living and being and why we're here. You know, they they offer us afford us so much clarity. I don't know why we we would want to sort of pretend like they aren't important. Yeah, it's a real tragedy that we're living in this system right now, because exactly what you're saying, it's taking the most 
profound teaching moments of our lives and turning them into junk <laughs> for what, you know, why are we even, why, why do that? Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's extraordinary that we would prep, we would privilege a scientific explanation over somebody being able to own their experiences and how profound and sacred those experiences were in their lives. Yes, yes. It's almost like we missed the forest for the trees, right? Like, let's put aside, let's let's just even say, who cares if it's not real, right? If it's not a real, quote unquote, real thing that happened. It's a perceived experience that's like monumental. And that in and of itself is valuable. And we should say, amazing, like, wonderful. Tell me about it. I'm so happy for you. Or that's so yes. healing. We shouldn't have to poke holes in it and say, well, that's ridiculous. That could never happen. It's like, that's not the point. <laughs> You're missing it. Yeah. I mean, that was my big takeaway with near-death experiences, like, as opposed to the stuff going on in the hospice, but actually interviewing people who'd had NDEs. Mm-hmm. Right. Like, I don't care if you were technically brain dead for 40 minutes versus one second or whatever. What's interesting is how this has altered your very voice when you talk to me. Hmm. Like the, the emotion in the voice of these people when you interview them, it's extraordinary. Hmm. The way their lives have changed, you know, how their perspectives have shifted so profoundly. You know, that's the takeaway. Something has happened to them that has had extraordinary impact on their lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my husband has brain cancer. And when he was diagnosed at 33, he changed his whole life. And, you know, obviously you kind of have to. And so he lives with a tumor and he'll have cancer. He'll never be in remission. He'll have brain cancer always. And he always says... I wouldn't wish this on my worst enemy, but I wish that everyone could experience this because it completely changed his life. We met, you know, right after he got diagnosed and we probably wouldn't be together if we, if we had met before. And we often talk about like, how do you give people an experience like this without like profound grief and sadness and fear and like the tragedy of it, but also it like opens up living in so many ways. And I wish that I wish that I could like hack it and make it easier for people. But I think that that's, that would be cheating them, <laughs> like robbing them of, of the whole point, you know? Yeah. It's, it's living in the light of death. You know, that's, that's an extraordinary experience. Wow. I'm, 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 is, is he going to be okay? Or is, is it like a benign tumor or, or? No, no, he has, um, it's called an anaplastic astrocytoma. And so he'll have cancer, you know, forever. And it's when it's in your brain, it's really hard to take it out because they scoop out part of your brain. So they took out, you know, 20% of it, needed chemo and radiation and it's still there. So we just watch it and get an MRI every three months and do everything in our power to keep him really healthy and not stress because that contributes to cancer growth and tumor growth and he eats a ketogenic diet because that's really great for your brain and it's anti-tumor and then we just like you know try to live (laughs) and and make sure that we're present as present as we can be and also like you know doing things that we really love and I'm really lucky that he I mean he's He's an extraordinary person, so I'm lucky to be with him. And I, I think that if anyone's going to beat any odds, it's probably probably my husband. But it's definitely my husband. But it's definitely, it's been an interesting experience to see how many people sort of like pull back once he starts talking about it. That really gets yeah. get a, get scared because confronting, it's almost like people are talking to a dead person. You know, yeah. when, when he starts talking sometimes once they, and they, you would never know that he was sick other than the fact that he's bald, um, but he doesn't look sick. And once people know, a lot of people really change. It really scares them. It's, it's very confronting to them. Yeah, I think, I think that's so true. And they, well, first of all, they don't have a common language. They don't, I mean, at least, uh, you know, 200 years ago, somebody could say, oh, I'm so sorry, but that's, you know, that's God's will or God had a plan. But now we, we, that we can't share that's you know that's too broken down in terms of who can say that and who can't say that and so on so 
Like nobody knows what they're allowed to say or what they're, and if they can't envision a spiritual future for him and opening up what, what it was the most beautiful quote I came across that I put in my book was the Rabin, Rabin Drinath Tagore, who was a, a Nobel laureate of literature from India in like 1920 or something. And he said, death is not the, how do you put it? Death is not the, is not the, is not the, the end of the light. It's the, it's the turning. It's not the, Death is not the turning out the light. It's the turning down the lamp because the dawn has come. Mm, that's beautiful. Yeah, I just totally mangled it. <laughs> no, that's a beautiful image. But you know what I mean? If mm -hmm. you have that perspective, it opens up a whole new vista to what you're going through. Mm -hmm. And if people understood that or felt comfortable with that, then they wouldn't be so frightened to talk to him. Yeah. And I think that you know, um, going back to what we were talking about with this sort of scientific perspective, people want to know where they stand. People want, people like, we like clarity, right? We like knowing and understanding and seeing something and not having complex feelings about it, being really black or white. I feel like now more than ever, if we look at like our political landscape and how we exist on the internet, we're very extreme. Uh, there's not a lot of space for nuance and gray and being feeling two ways at the same time, right? Feeling yeah. sad for someone and also being in awe of someone and being scared and also loving them. And that complex sort of mix of emotions is almost... It's almost like we haven't flexed those muscles enough. Uh, we don't flex them enough in our day to day. So when we're confronted with it, it's like, whoa. And I wonder if that's kind of what happens too for people who are, who either have a near death experience um, and want to talk about it or for people who are, see a loved one die and have this end of life experience where they're talking to their ancestors or to their husband who's passed on or to somebody in the room. If it's like, it's, it's so much like in one, on one side, you're so happy for them, right? Like, Oh, wow. That's so beautiful. And on the other, it's like, I don't want them to die. I don't want them to leave me. I don't, I don't want this to mean something. And we want to explain it, you know, before we sort of share it with others. Oh yeah. I mean, there's a huge amount of floundering in that and because there's not a lot of surrender, you know, it, it was funny because when, when I, when I, when I started to write this book about what happened to my sister, you know, two of my best friends are psychiatrists and I'm a journalist and I'm part of this journalistic tradition of skepticism. And mm -hmm. I was genuinely scared to publish this book. Why? I was scared for my reputation, mm. you know? And I remember this feeling of just being, not even wanting to admit to my friends, like, well, what are you working on now? And if they were psych that my two psychiatrist friends, I didn't want to tell them. Mm -hmm. And, 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 I feel like I've come so far in the last few years from that place mm -hmm. where I'm able to be so much more fluid and flexible with, with my comfort around it. So it is like flexing a muscle. I think you're right. Like there, we have to start opening up more space around ourselves, for feeling all of these and for surrendering to them, surrendering mm -hmm. and saying, I'm not in control. I'm not the expert, but, but this is, this is life in a wave. And it, it, you know, and those are what the religious traditions are there for to teach us, you know, mm -hmm. when they're not trying to exert, you know, control and persecute us. So there's like two different sets. <laughs> right. <laughs> they're like on the opposite ends of the spectrum, right? Nice yeah. <laughs> yeah. Grief is one of those really powerful, like it, it, when someone is in their grief process, they're extremely powerful. It's like a raw nerve or like a raw wire, I think. And it can be really intimidating and scary from someone on the outside because you also don't know what to say. You don't know because grief is completely unpredictable. You know, like you think can think you're over something or that you're moved past it. And then you're standing in line at a movie theater. You hear a song and all of a sudden, like you can't cope, you know, you're breaking down into tears. And you're like, wait, what? <laughs> Where did that come from? I thought I got over this. Like I went to therapy and we don't, we want grief to be that, that easy, whatever five-step process, right? Acceptance where that ends with acceptance, but it's so, at least in my experience, it is so not that. And I think that that's that question of it being powerful and of you being powerful in it and that's mm -hmm. scaring people. I've never really thought about it quite that way, but because you're so close to the truth of something so inutterably important. 
that nobody mm-hmm. can smother it with small talk. Mm-hmm. And that and it's, freaks them out. Yeah. And it's not logical. You know, going back to the science thing, it's, it's grief isn't logical and it's not linear. It's and logical. yeah, yeah. And, it, you know, I was, I was, while you were speaking about you, what your friends might think as you published this book, it's like, well, she's obviously, Patricia's so smart, obviously. Why would she be worried about what people would think about her? But, you know, grief is scary for other people when, you know, people in their grief are very intimidating, especially if we feel useless as to how to help them. And we kind of write off people in grief as crazy. Like, yeah. oh, they tempor- they went temporarily insane or like, oh, you know, they're working on that because they're they're grieving. So, you know, just like give them some time. But I think that's like so dismissive. Yeah, that, that it's so dismissive. And it's that's a, you being very thought provoking with me right now. And it's, of course, you know, I have to, it's going to I'm going to wake up at three in the morning and think, oh, wait, this is what I wanted to say in response to that. <laughs> You can leave me a voice note. <laughs> you can email it to me. I would love. I would love to hear more thoughts. <laughs> Do you have a favorite? Oh, oh, go ahead. No, you go ahead. No, 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 please. No, no save me from my own. Shut up, cat. Save me from my own stammering. <laughs> I was just gonna ask. You know, do you prefer to talk about near death experiences, or do you? What what's more interesting and exciting to you in near death experiences and hearing about them? I feel like there's a lot of writing on near death experiences or these end of life moments when a dying person is sort of flickering between this this world and another dimension and they kind of get special access, almost like a sneak preview to what's to come. Yeah, I'm increasingly really interested in what I would call the threshold experiences. And and I, and also what I'm interested in is is the is the ways in which the world remains in flickering enchantment and and we keep acting as if that was that was from yesteryear that that's no longer now that oh sure maybe people in the 19th century believed in fairies because they were victorians but they don't now but in fact there's all these presences all the time in all the different cultures including our own that we're sensing and and interacting with all the time and the world remains enchanted and we don't officially admit that and i find that fascinating wow i love that you said that i'm nodding my head profusely because that was something that that was the reason i was really called to study being a death doula i'm really i really want to bring back ritual to the death experience and like there, I, I'm Italian. There are so many rituals around death in sort of Italian folklore and magic that you just don't know, that you don't talk about, and that Catholicism sort of like stamped out, you know. But for how did you come to that conclusion around enchantment? Well, it started with with realizing all the pe- all the people were who were sensing the presence of the dead, and then mm-hmm. I started finding about all these people who were like mountain climbers and solo hikers and people in World War One and World War Two who were on the battlefield who were sensing the presence of what were basically guardian angels, although they didn't mm-hmm. call it that, but that there was there were sensed presences that were helping them out of danger. Mm-hmm. And so that's a totally different context than grief. Mm-hmm. And then I started realizing that there's all these different cultures that still believe like in Ireland and Iceland, they still believe in in fairies and elves. Mm-hmm. you know, and actually see them or they think they see them, right? So I'm like, yeah. wait a minute, we're, this is still going on, like all around us. And we're, we kind of put it in a past tense. We're, we're, we kind of pretend that it used to happen, but doesn't, you know what I mean? And it's just so interesting that the people are still, that now it's become the illicit spiritual, mm-hmm. that it's all illegal what we're having. The experiences we have now are illegal, we can't mm-hmm. talk about them, but you can't swing a cat without hitting somebody who's who's had some experience that suggests that enchantment still is the world that we're in. Yeah, this is what we do. With this is what we talk about at holisticism all day in, in every context. And a lot of people listening are like, "Yeah, I believe in all that stuff." <laughs> I'm not in Iceland or Ireland, but I believe in in fairies and you know thresholds and portals and entities and spiritual teams that are always surrounding you. And 
part of reading, you know, reading your book, I, I actually had never really like investigated, I guess, my own belief, which is we have a spiritual team around us all the time. We just like can't see them. And when we're at that, when we're, I'll use your word flickering at the threshold, it's almost like we get, we get 2020 vision or like someone's finally giving us the glasses to see them. And, and they've always been there. And I think lots of people talk to their spiritual team or they hear their spiritual team or their ancestors or their guides or whom, however you'd like to call them. And it's like, oh, oh, I've been talking to you on the phone and now I get to see your face. How nice. (laughs) How nice is that? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. And I guess my other big takeaway from, from writing, researching my book was really what you're saying was the revelation that we, we, we don't die alone. Mm-hmm. We're never alone, no matter how physically alone we are, you know, dying on the battlefield, under a bridge, in the middle of the ocean. We're actually not alone. There are all mm-hmm. these spiritual beings around us. Yeah. And we're never alone, period full stop. Like we're never really alone. And of course, in our most vulnerable moments or scared moments, that's nice to hear. But I think it's also nice to just know as you're going through the mundane, (laughs) the mundanity of life, your day to day, like you, you're not having a singular experience because your spiritual team or whomever is around you, your ancestors, but also because as humans, we have archetypal experiences and that death is an archetypal experience, right? We all go through it. We all have that threshold experience, like the threshold experience of birth. And it feels, it's so interesting that it's so scary and it seems so lonely to talk about when it's the only inevitability that we all have and that we all share. It kind of just boggles my mind that it's not something that we're all like, cool, we got this in common. Let's talk about that a little bit more, you know? I know. I just, I, I, you know, when I was with my sister, when she, in the hospital in Montreal, when the doctor came in to announce that she was palliative Mm. and we were, the two of us were sitting on her, on her hospital bed and, and, and he, he, the, the most incredible thing she said to me, we were, we were forehead to forehead, knee to knee, like, mm-hmm. like two little sisters in a bed. And, and she whispered to me and she said, well, I guess, she said, I guess lots of people have gone through this before me, haven't they? Mm-hmm. And it was like the most heartbreaking and yet the most weirdly profound thing she was coming to terms with in that moment. Mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. other people have done this before me yeah that just gave me full body shells thank you for sharing that <sighs> yeah it's it does seem like some of the most profound experiences of living are the ones that we all that many of us share you know becoming a parent or a mother and and watching someone you love die or or, or dying right like we all we all have those types of experience. Many of us have those, those types of experiences and they are the profound, the most profound moments of our lives. The things that really change us. And, and yet it's kind of like that mundane magic. Like they are in a way sort of a mundane experience because, because they happen. Yeah. And they're also considered mundane because men have decided what the entire narrative of glory has been for the last mm-hmm. 8,000 billion years. And women <laughs> are the ones who become the mothers, who, who were at the bedsides, who watch the dying, and mm-hmm. who take these things seriously and with open hearts. And so everything that we see and think about has been thrown to the side as irrational and, and superstitious and sentimental and not important. And the important things are gaining money and being at the top of the, you know, being like that HBO show right now, Succession. With Succession yeah. Like mm-hmm. that, that's what we've elevated in the culture through a masculine lens. Mm-hmm. And all the things that are the most profound that we have the most in common are really understood better by, I mean, I shouldn't say that by, you know, I don't mean to say women have a better understanding, but I'm saying that women have been more open to talking about them and they've been relegated to the back room. Yeah, it's, it's very... 
<laughs> it's it's a, a theme that we hear on repeat, <laughs> you know, <laughs> unfortunately. But I think that's you you put it so astutely, like as the kin keepers, anyone who's a kin keeper. Yeah. yeah, that's those like profound moments and experiences sort of get swept under the rug. It's unimportant, but they are, again, the most important, like the, the mundane. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Oh, this was Patricia. I could talk to you all day long at you and your cat, Chubby. Was there anything I should have asked you that I didn't? What's my favorite color? What's your favorite color? <laughs> <laughs> beautiful i'm more of a green person but hence my background today great and and patricia where can people find you and, and do you want to talk about what you're working on or i do actually because so where i'm trying to go next is i'm i'm, I'm writing a follow-up book where i want to explore first i want to get away to some extent from these sort of western perspectives so i want to explore more like the what we call a grief hallucination which is the presence of the person after they've died um, what, you know, who has that, what happens to them? When does it happen? What does it look like if you're Native American? What does it look like if you're African American, you know, as opposed to how psychiatrists have told us all a hallucination. And then I want to expand that into like what I was saying about these threshold experiences, like how else do we experience these, these, you know, these, these, how else do we become, do we become aware of being in relationship with a spiritual world, whether mm -hmm. it's through imaginary friends in childhood or fairies or there's different words for those kinds of liminal creatures or woodland creatures that we experience so i'm really looking for stories and experiences around that for for this book that i'm starting to write so i would invite any of your listeners to get in touch with me if they want okay. to talk about that Okay, I know that they will. So I'll put your contact info. Yeah. I'll put your contact in in the show notes, and I'll throw you I'll throw you one. Have you researched sleep paralysis? At yes, all? exactly. I have. So I have sleep paralysis. I also have ep mm -hmm. I also have epilepsy, and I've been having seizures since I was seventeen, which is right. also I would say a threshold experience personally. Right. But sleep paralysis is really interesting. It's been like was terrifying and now I understand it and know what it is and I can see things and people and it's really weird but it's definitely a threshold experience <laughs> oh I would love to talk to you more about that yeah we'll have to do, we'll we'll have to you, circle up and double click on it in LA? Mm -hmm. in yeah I'm in LA so I'm going to yeah. be here November 20th for oh. like just about 10 days Cool. I'm I'm going to be traveling. My my partner and I are actually getting married on the 20th in front of our families because we yeah now that we're sort of out of the pandemic can safely have a wedding with with some people and then we're going on our honeymoon. So I might miss you, but I would love to meet you in person at some point. Well, my daughter just moved to LA, so I'm sure we will. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. That's the paralysis because I did a little bit of it in opening heaven's door and and. Oh my God, is that ever a fascinating subject? It's, yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, I'm a very skeptical person and full, see full thing. Like, yeah, it's really, it's really interesting. I'll, I can't wait to talk to you more about it. <laughs> That's great. Awesome. Well, Patricia, thank you so much for taking the time. This was such a wonder. You're so smart. I just like, and so compassionate and I love how balanced you are in your skepticism and in your spirituality. It's, it's refreshing. Well, thank you, Michelle. I was, I feel very, I feel very held in your space. <laughs> I'm so happy to hear that. <laughs> awesome. That was All right. And that's our episode. I hope that you enjoyed this this conversation. I can't wait to hear what you think and go find Patricia, go buy her book. And if you've got some awesome threshold experiences to share with her, definitely hit her up. We'll see you on Friday. We have a very, very, very special episode and I know you're going to like it a lot. So stay tuned. Make sure, make sure that you're subscribed to the 12th house podcast 
so that you get every single episode that we put out into the airwaves. And if you rate and review us, it really helps us on the charts and we appreciate you. This month, we are giving away a seat in our class, Notion for Magical Body Systems and Spells. So if you take a screenshot of your review and you send it to us, then you'll be entered to win. We'd love to have you. It'd be so fun. Okay, that's all I've got for you. I'll see you on Friday and I'll see you on the internet. Bye.